Welcome to this week's VLSI Insider. This is Dan Hutchison. This is Andrea Latte. And this is Risto Puhakka. So we've been doing a lot of travels lately, so we thought we would just kind of go through a uh, travel report. Uh, I went to ITPC and the MOVE conference in, uh, in London, and then Risto was off to Semicon Europa and just got back. So. Uh, I'm going to kick off and kind of talk about some of the things I saw. People were pretty bullish at Semi's ITPC. I have to really commend Semi for the boldness of, of pulling off a, a physical conference and getting, you know, senior executives as well as all of the executives that were brave enough to uh, come to Hawaii. Uh, the weather was beautiful, as it almost always is, but sometimes it can be way too hot. But uh, uh, the markets were hot, but the weather was was kind of cool, which kind of reflected, you know, kind of the cooling off we've been seeing in the in the marketplace. But people were still really bullish about next year. If there's any concerns, it's about 2023, which is what our forecast has been uh, pretty much uh, predicting. As uh, uh, at the Move conference, it was kind of interesting. It was an automotive conference. Uh, it was for um, sustainable mobility, which just means electric cars and scooters and whatnot. And it was kind of, uh, apparently from what I'd heard the previous time, there were about 4X the exhibitors, 4X the size of what was there. And uh, uh, it was a lot smaller. Instead of having an international audience, unlike ITPC, where people literally did come from all over the world to be at ITPC. In fact, uh, at ITPC, poor Christoph from ASML, he was supposed to give a presentation, but because he didn't use a Hawaii authorized uh, testing facility, they made him go back. Uh, <laughs> so uh, those are kind of the kinks that go on with this crazy thing and you get vaccinated everywhere you go. But uh, uh, the funny thing about the MOVE conference was it was almost all people from the UK. The other funny thing was for everyone that remembers about five years ago when you could go up to Sand Hill Road and say, I have an electric scooter and they'd say you're funded. You know, and you could have the world's best uh, AI system or whatever, and you couldn't get funded until you said it was an electric scooter company. Uh, that was the way it looked when I walked around the show floor. There were just tons and tons of electric scooter companies uh, doing their wells and just, just sort of electric, you know, small scale mobility. Um, the most interesting thing I found out was the way that Geely, the Chinese manufacturer, and Tesla are dealing with the chip shortages. They're simply shifting over and using consumer grade components. And apparently they've been doing it all along as a way to uh, uh, maintain profitability, keep the cost down because automotive com components with all of their really super rigid reliability uh, requirements. In fact, they have the most rigid reliability com com uh, requirements next to space because um, uh, they don't have to work in a vacuum. Uh, but the uh, 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 so that's how they're actually dealing with this and able to continue shipping cars and not really being hit by the, uh, the shortage. So, uh, 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 but that was the most you know interesting thing I found. Uh, and then because I was the uh, the token chip guy, everybody was beating me up about when they could get more chips. So the auto companies are still seeing problems with being able to get chips. But when I said to them that. They were, the production was way up. The problem was is that the, the, it's single items of chips like we've been saying before, you know, like the, uh, the supply chain head of Volkswagen had said uh, to me that, uh, uh, you know, a 60 cent part causes, cost them $60,000 in revenues. So uh, 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 that's, the, <laughs> really, that's the problem they face. Really interesting leverage, yeah. yeah so, so. Or negative leverage. <laughs> So anyway, uh, Risto, what, how did your travels go? Uh, well, basically, uh, Semicon Europe was was on, and you know, it was basically, uh, you know, given given uh, the 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 COVID surge in Europe, it was like day before, you know, should we go? Should we should we not go? And and um, and then then continued because there was commitments commitments at the show, namely namely presenting uh, on the packaging conference there, but. Uh, you know, Semi put together very nice, very nice, um, you know, trade show. Uh, it was actually pretty well attended. I was, I was surprised uh, seeing, uh, you know, people in uh, in the show floor. It was, it was not super crowded, but it was, it was a reasonably busy, busy trade show. So, 
people, uh, even though there were some cancellations, people people happily attended and um, and. Uh, Hey, we're, we're semi people. We brave the jungles of Malaysia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's true. The worst yeah. environments. You know, we go into earthquake zones. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's that's uh yeah. And, and they they did it locally, and and they did a great job, and you know they and and all of that. But you know the the thing I and I have to say this uh, is that you know the value on those trade shows and conferences is the time one on one time with the executives having those over the cup of coffee or beer or wine or whatever it is, but having those conversations, just figuring out, comparing the notes, you know, what we see, what they see and, and getting those little, little tidbits of insights, you know, that, that impacts on, on, on our data and our views of the world. And, in, uh, and it's, it's just invaluable and we've been missing it for, for a couple of years almost. So, so and, the funny thing was, though, is you got on a plane, you went to the Netherlands just as it was being let down. So you went to the Netherlands to have a Zoom yeah. meeting in the Netherlands, right? Yeah, yeah. No, actually, actually, I never, never, I, I never went to Netherlands. I, I, I stayed in Munich, but, okay. uh, but we had a, we had a great meeting on, on Teams. It was supposed to be face to face, and uh, after two, three hours, we were, we were done and got everything done, and then we were like, oh. It would be nice to have a beer now, but uh, we, we had to move that out for for whatever whatever time. But we'll we'll get there. So so we got the we got the job done. But uh, but let's let's just uh, you know the just a couple of things you know uh, the the equipment suppliers the equipment supply chain is extremely bullish and and uh, in uh, in the projections for next year are pretty high you know they're much higher than our forecast is uh but there are some supply chain issues because equipment supply chain is still catching up with the surge in in inventories you know component inventories are low so all those needs to be replenished so so uh, so i mean uh, i i heard as high numbers as 50 percent up projections next year uh, in in uh, in you know ours ours equipment forecast is in a, in a, in a fifteen percent range right now. So so we are kind of looking at that number. You know, Andrea can fill it in where what what it would look like in in, in all of that. So so those are those are the the things. But there are also issues related to inventories in the supply chain, component shortages, and and all of that. So. So and all those are impacting on that, but yeah, the mood is very very positive uh, for next year. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was some uh, some little little it, it's in the, in the material space little cancellations <laughs> where the customers were or not cancellations the orders just didn't materialize in uh, in they were blamed on pricing, but uh, but uh, in in of course those those expected orders were filled on other parts so there was no no impact but uh, but nevertheless it's uh, there is some movements in the background there it's not big but something to pay attention to down the line that it's not not gloom, you know great and smooth and everything else things things move around in the background a lot so so that's kind of the kind of the thing and just the final thing i'm just happy that you know semi Kept the kept the kept the trade show going and and got a really nice nice trade show there, which kind of opened the opened a little bit of the international side of the trade show. So so that was really really good to see from Semi. Very happy. Yeah, it was amazing to feel what the importance of, of Semi trying to yeah. bring the industry and keep it going. Yeah, the physical meetings is just amazing. So. Yeah. So so Andrea, um, I I went to Hawaii for ITPC. You went to Hawaii. I didn't get sand in my shoes. You did. I had to do it for you then. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> All I saw was conference rooms and I could see the beach from afar. <laughs> but but uh, uh, you've also spent most of your time uh, doing, um, you know, trolling through the data and trying to figure out what's, what you're seeing there and also updating the forecast, the November forecast. So what are you seeing? Any big changes? Uh, actually, the data came in line with our expectations, especially for the equipment market and semiconductors. Um, we're 
pretty much going to close the year at about 26% for ICs and at about 40% for equipment, which is a range that we've had for a while now, actually. And again, this has been a very good year for both semiconductors and uh, the semiconductor equipment. Just a, as a reference point, they've had seven consecutive quarters of increases. So too much for seasonality that we usually have. We, there was no seasonality this year. It's been just, you know, a great year all around. And again, next year is a little bit, you know, more difficult to forecast given what's happening. But again, we're still pretty positive. Uh, right now we're at about 15% for uh, equipment and at about 11% for semiconductors. And as Riso said, you know, we're hearing some numbers as high as 50 uh, I don't see that happening yet. I mean, but anything is possible in this industry. But I think that the 15% seems, you know, a reasonable range, at least for the time being. And again, there is a lot of unmet demand for this year that's going to roll into uh, 2022. And again, the foundry and the uh, advanced logic segments are expected to be very strong next year as well, based on the announcements that we're uh, getting from, you know, the foundries and also Intel, and more lately also in the analog space, TI, that is building, you know, several fabs in uh, in Texas. So, you know, there is a lot of order activity out there, and um, and I, I believe that a lot of it will turn into equipment sales next year. Yeah, okay, well, great. Thanks for the, uh, the update. Anything else, guys? Okay, well, I think we're done. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, uh, thank you, guys. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan.